This is a complete spoiler, so if you want to play the game, don't watch this. Okay. Due to the structure of this game, the word summation fits better than abridgment. Anyway, here we go. Now that text right there pops up at the beginning of the game, and it cannot be more true. And I, for one, love it. The first thing that will hit you like a sherry high is how goddamn gorgeous the game is. It's by far one of the most beautiful playable scenarios ever put to screen. I mean, look at it. Look at that, for God's sake, guys, look at it! You enter this beautiful but menacing world wearing the skin of Paul Prospero, a slick, deep-voiced psychic detective. He seems to be the love child of Sherlock Holmes and that woman from Medium, Alison Dubois or whatever. Prospero has his own Sherlock Holmesian deduction overlay and the Medium-like ability to psychically experience violent events. These are the tools we are given. At first, the open world of Red Creek seems a bit overwhelming. You don't really know where to go or what to do. And when you do find something to do, it's a bit confusing and weird. This can lead to a bit of an aimless trek for a while. But you don't really mind, since the game sports one of the most stunning vistas ever created using the Unreal, Unreal Development, Development Kit. Kit. Sorry, I'm way too excited about the graphics. Anyway, soon enough you'll wrap your head around the game structure. Each area is a scene with a mystery that needs to be solved. As a player, you have to be thorough in order to find all the clues. Only when enough clues have been gathered can Prospero use his abilities to psychically visualize the scene. It is like finding the pieces of a chronologically dependent puzzle. When you have all the pieces, you have to put them together in the right order in the timeline. If you break it down to its core, the game depends on a simple collection mechanic. Nothing like that used in Slender games. But how it is presented, packaged and executed makes it feel like something else entirely. And the fact that it has a strong narrative frame really makes it come together. I say narrative frame since a lot of the stories are for interpretation. The game also features several enjoyable puzzles. Let's break down the actual story. It's divided into 10 scenes. 1. The Forest Traps 2. Railcar Murder 3. Spaceman 4. Fake Interiors 5. The Witch's House 6. Graveyard Murder 7. Murder in the Mines 8. Minegate Maze 9. Murder at the Dam 10. The Vandegrift House But I'm gonna jumble them a bit. That's how the game played out for me. Going in I stumble on the traps, sensed a few but not enough of them to get a full scene. Then I half solved a murder by the train tracks but instead I ended up chasing an astronaut. And I flew out of space in a pod of some kind, and I'm back in the forest after reading a story, followed by a piece of dialogue featuring Ethan and his family. This is a reoccurring theme, something fantastical or horrid happens, followed by a story written by Ethan that semi-overlaps with the fantastical and the real world. Solving a scene unlocks dialogue that hints at a dysfunctional family being taken over by some kind of darkness. Ethan seems to be ostracized and even ridiculed by some of his family members. And it also seems that some family members wants him dead. The first puzzle I cracked was the piecing together of the layout of a burnt down house. Through the reading of a sort of spell and the use of psychic abilities, I puzzled it together. This led me to a secret magical lab in one house and gave me access to another building. There's a bit more to it than that, but whatever. I read another one of Ethan's stories and it features the magical lab and a wizard and how the town folks burned the wizard's house down to get to his potions. After I read it, reality snapped back and I stood in a moonshine still, reading an article about it burning down. It was here it hit me. A lot of what I had experienced had probably never happened, but it was Ethan's interpretation of reality. A way to escape his dire situation at home. Still, the murders and the dangers he was in seemed real enough. I got used to the menacing but non-threatening environment. Red Creek is a place where you look into the dangers of the past through a Lovecraftian lens. No threats, jump scares or monsters. Holy shit did I get it wrong! And look! Cthulhu's cousin! Yes, great. So there is indeed something dark and terrible taking over the family members. This thing is called the Sleeper. One by one I solved the murders and cracked the mysteries. Mother Gale murdered her brother Shad while he tried to murder Ethan's father Dale. Dale in turn murdered Gale in order to help Ethan. For the very same reason Dale tried to kill his oldest son, Ethan's older brother Travis. But Dale failed and was cornered. 
Instead of being taken over by the darkness or being murdered by Travis, Dale jammed a pair of scissors in his own throat. Travis then tried to murder Ethan by tying him to the train track so he could run him over with a train car. But he was instead run over by Grandpa Ed who tried to help Ethan. So yeah, not a very happy family. And Ethan seems hell-bent on destroying a secret room he found in the old Vandergriff house. Vandergriff being some dead old rich bastard with a surly money-grubbing son who lives in Chicago. Ethan was in danger and I really wanted to find him. Monsters and threats be damned. I managed to track him down to the Vandergriff house. And here the real truth was revealed. Ethan was just a poor kid who had a harsh life with his dysfunctional family. He used his stories to escape reality and was ridiculed for it. All that we had experienced, except the snippets of family dialogue, was indeed part of Ethan's stories. Even Prosper was part of Ethan's imagination and claimed that he had been made real through these stories. Alright, here's the deal. The family had gone looking for Ethan as he had missed dinner. He had hid away in an abandoned house to write his stories. When they found him, the mother accidentally dropped a kerosene lamp. The old house caught fire with Ethan inside, suffocating on the smoke. And it is at this point Prosper comes to him as a figment of his imagination, presumably. Prosper tells Ethan that it's alright to let go, and that it will simply lead to another story. Ethan is dead. We zoom out through the flames and see how his family is trying to save him. Then we sail off to the end credits. The end. <laughs> okay, here are some possible takes on this. When Ethan lies down in the smoke-filled room, the time is 7. When we leave Ethan, trapped and dead, the time is 4 past 7. It might be that all that we experienced, which took some hours, was in fact what went through Ethan's mind as he died. It took him 4 minutes to die, and instead of having his life flash in front of his eyes, he saw his stories. Another interpretation is that Prospero indeed is death, normally unfeeling but given pathos through the boy's imagination. And given emotion, he lives through the stories, sparing Ethan the pain and fear in his last moments. Well, those are two of my interpretations, if you have any, cough them up. When all is said and done, this was a great game and I highly recommend it. Many games try to do what this game does, but few, if any, pull it off. The vanishing of Ethan Carter was a paradox in a sense, when it comes to its structure. It was a linear open world, but it worked for me. And you know what? I'm gonna say it again. I, I, I kinda have to. The game is freaking gorgeous! Uh, okay, that... yeah, that, that's all. Have a good one.